some degree about personal revival which comes again of course in the first place by obedience to the spirit Paul says in Acts I forget is it 26 there he gives the spirit to them that obey him and again this is the key not only to obtaining blessing but to maintaining it there has to be continual obedience and again there's a constant necessity as Paul said to Timothy to stir up the gift of God which is in you the, the Greek actually there means to stir into a flame it's like a fire that's going out and you know you fan it and, uh, and gradually the flame comes back and you've got to keep it doesn't say God will stir you up and it doesn't say I will stir you up it says you stir yourself up you have that ability if you have the ability, the ability which we all have to be lethargic <laughs> we don't need any training in those things do it some things you don't have to try for you don't have to practice failure for instance that comes pretty automatic and uh, laziness you don't have to practice and apathy and there are some things which you the, the, the flesh because we we're in this house of clay that uh, old A.B. Simpson used to talk about perishing things of clay we live in a house of clay and uh, the, often it is true of us that the spirit is willing the flesh is weak for many reasons you get overtired you get nervous uh, you have problems on your mind and, and these all begin to drain and then we, what, what we have to do again is go to the word which as we said is uh, uh, we didn't go through it but seven times is mentioned uh, in the 119th Psalm read the verses there uh, quicken me according to thy word uh, quicken me uh, according to thy judgments quicken me according to thy loving kindness when I see those things immediately I'm roused to think oh the loving kindness of God he could have cut me off and dropped me into hell before ever I was saved but in loving kindness he pursued me he, he followed me and so there is this constant need that whatever provision God has made I still have to appropriate and, and this is again why some people mature more quickly than others I, I remember a period in my own life and I thought well I've, I've got that in my mind I've got it down in a book and that's all right and, and I soon discovered that the head knowledge in itself is not enough God works it in but you work out your own salvation and this again is why we mature at different rates uh, I thought this afternoon we would think about um, we, we talked about revival in a personal way this morning we <coughs> Tommy, we talk about revival on the local level and I don't think there is a better example of, uh, of this than in the case of Charles Haddon Spurgeon himself I don't know he was the most prolific uh, writer but he's the uh, most uh, has the most recorded sermons I think of anybody in, in history he, he had the Park Street pulpit where he was before he went to the um, some famous gardens in England and then after that uh, place they built a tabernacle and you get the tabernacle sermons and there's a, a, an awesome amount he's, he's got oceans literally oceans of words uh, uh, Whitfield went to hear a man one day and, and somebody asked him what do you think about the preaching of the man he said well he had a river of words with a spoonful of inspiration <laughs> now very often I think we can particularly in preaching it's possible almost to drown a text in human words I hear people say well you, you can't people can't concentrate more than 20 minutes well they do when they go to an opera they listen to an opera for three hours and if they can listen to that they should listen to the word because the word is supposed to be living and vital and vibrant and it isn't a reflection on the preacher it's a reflection on our capacity it's like saying that uh, it's no good giving a man a seven course dinner I've been to some places I've lived all over the place lived in mud huts I've lived in castles I've lived with the rich and the poor and I've been to places where you you know you have finger bowls an American got one he drank it <coughs> but uh, you have finger bowls you, you're supposed to use immediately after you've uh, for instance had fish and somebody hands you a little towel you hand it back and you, you have these flunkies around you and, and uh, it, it, it's an awful job you know you sit down there uh, you know and it's going to take two or three hours but you know it never gets boring you, you, if you have the appetite you'll, you, you enjoy it. it it reminds me of you know in the um, in the days prior to the Chinese revolution uh, the Soongs S-O-O-N-G the Soongs were the intellectual family of China 
I think uh, Chiang Kai-shek was married to a Soong, a woman who had, I think, uh, doctorate degrees, and the family was very brilliant. And one of the Soongs was uh, an ambassador. He was the ambassador of China to England. And he went to one of these snobbish parties where uh, dukes and lords and ladies were, you know, and he arrived late. He was supposed to offer the toast to the Queen, and he... Well, the Queen wasn't there, but she was going to offer the toast to her. But uh, the toast was to the Queen, and, and uh, he got there late. And uh, so as he came in, they'd already served the soup and they passed him his soup and he just bowed and nodded to each person. He drank the soup and uh, um, the, the snobbish Englishman next to him said to him, likey soupy? You see, because Chinese usually say it that way, likey soupy? And he said, yes. And at the end of the uh, dinner, they said, well, His Excellency, uh, Dr. Soong of China was not here, so we're going to ask him to... Uh, give a toast to the Queen right now and he stood up and he gave a marvellous speech in flawless English he sat down and looked at the Colonel who was looking you know so dignified at him and as he sat down he said like he's speechy <coughs> uh, you know you, you can never presume sometimes we kind of uh, uh, as one uh, famous Englishman said you can never overestimate the ignorance of your congregation that is true but very often you can't overestimate the intellectual power of your audience. And the only way you can have real assurance in presenting a message is that you've got a word from God. And if you've got a word from God, you don't care whether it's a kind of a super intellectual group or they're a bit dumb. Because I discover very often that the most intellectual, and I've often spoken university groups and, and scholars far beyond me intellectually, but if God has given me a word, I know that that word is needed in that particular uh, uh, group whatever the social standing whatever the intellectual standing is that I've got the word of the Lord and, and uh, those people have to receive it as God's word and I have to deliver it as God's word not, not being nervous not being mindful of those people you know Paul was at home everywhere and I think one reason was this he bowed the knee he said I bowed the knee to the Father and if you bow the knee to the Father you don't need to bow it to anybody else if you bow the knee to the Father, you can stand on your feet before I don't care who's there in front of you. They, you won't be intimidated by their social or intellectual or even spiritual standing because you've got the Word of God. All right, we talked about the, the revival in America that's sometimes called the 59 revival, that uh, it's spilled over, or at least uh, there were kind of waves that went into England, but uh, Spurgeon said that uh, even six years before the revival touched England or his part of England he had had a measure of revival before that now uh, he's a phenomenon in many ways I understand that uh, uh, all the biographers say that he was converted when he was 15 uh, he didn't make it to the church he wanted to go to he slipped into a church and sat under the gallery and he heard a very ordinary man give a rather ordinary message and yet it was God's word that was quick and powerful it barbed into his heart now there he was 15 years of age at 19 years of age without any Bible training without any seminary training at 19 years of age he's a very distinguished preacher now I've heard people say that immediately he drew 6,000 people a day 12,000 people a day no he did not he had a, a period of uh, if you like to say God's training in a, in a smaller building and uh, then he went to a place which became very famous, New Park Street Chapel. Now, now he says that before the revival touched his, uh, uh, touched London in any great way, he already had had a touch of revival six years before that in the New Park Street Chapel. Now he stayed in the New Park Street Chapel, and uh, it, it, within a year of him being there, it was jammed out. So they pulled all the side walls out, all the side buildings out, made one great auditorium, seating some thousands. And within 12 months, that was too small. This is showing again the power of revival on the local level. Now, he'd already enlarged his church once, he enlarges it a second time, and then it wasn't possible for him to get the crowds in. They were turning two or three thousand people away every Sunday. So he went down to what was called... Uh, the uh, Surrey Gardens I think it was called Surrey Garden Royal Surrey Gardens Music Hall now it wasn't a music hall in the sense that we think of a music hall it was a conservatoire where they had classical music uh, once or twice a month and it seated something like 10,000 people now 
You'd imagine that this young fellow going to a place like that, he was still in his twenties, I guess, and uh, you'd imagine that uh, when they move out of a place, say, that had uh, 3,000, enlarge it to 4,000, and uh, that when you take a place holding, well, some say 12,000 people, uh, he gave out tickets first to his own people, which were about 8,000, and then they discovered the first Sunday when they were there, that while it did hold about 12,000, there were 10,000 people outside trying to get in. Now it is true that there have been preachers who have preached to greater crowds. Billy Graham's preached to 125,000. He preached to a million in Korea. Somebody said after that he had a problem. The next meeting he went to, he'd only about 60,000 and, and, and he had a tremendous reaction. You know, it's a small crowd, 60,000. After a million, you can't see the last man, whether he's got blue eyes or no eyes at all, on the edge of the crowd. And, and, and the reaction was pretty bad. But nobody has preached consistently as a pastor to more, pre to, to more people than Spurgeon did. So now we find him with this auditorium that seats 12,000 people. Then they decided he visualized building the largest church in the world. And he started a fund to do that. But you see, again, if God opens the windows of heaven, the, door open, the, the devil opens the, doors of he the door of hell. And you get caught between the two. So he goes down to this uh, building, this uh, Surrey Gardens, what was it called? Surrey Gardens Music Conservatory. And the crowd was milling outside. When he got there, he was nervous himself. Why, well, I, th I thought we'd made accommodation. Aren't the doors open? Yes, they're open. It's jammed out. And 10,000 people outside. So he goes in. Here the place is loaded to the utmost capacity. And just as he was going to begin the service, somebody, nobody knows to this day who, somebody shouted, fire, fire. And immediately there was a stampede, then somebody else yelled, the galleries are collapsing, the galleries are collapsing. People began to jump from the galleries to save their lives. The result was that 28 people were injured, uh, 7 people were killed. There was panic, and then he, he got up and, uh, and uh, somebody said, well, preach, preach. And he gave them a word, I think, from Jeremiah about judgment shall come in the house of the wicked. But you see, immediately you start doing anything which is going to damage the kingdom of God, all Lucifer is going to fight back anyhow. Now that was not the worst, it was not just a physical evidence. The worst was they began to slander him, they began to criticize him. Some people even said it was fellows that didn't believe in the doctrine that he preached that that, that shouted fire, thinking it would just scare people, not dreaming, of course, that people would lose their lives and all the other things that we never think of when we do the crazy things we do, when we're, when we're just disobedient, when we're just careless. But, you know, that, that so stayed in his mind that a number of years after, he went to a great conference, uh, I'm not sure if it was in Brighton, England, and when he got there, there was a crowd outside, and it brought back memories, and when he got inside, the place was jammed, and they were standing everywhere, and they said he had to lean on a doorpost, he, he, he blanched, he went white. When, it, when again he visualized the stampede in that uh, Surrey Gardens music hall, which caused disaster, caused death. You see, it had built that thing up in his mind, and there was still that fear, which, which, you, which you could understand. But again, if we're going to do the will of God, what's going to happen? Well, as soon as we uh, start making headway for God, what, what happens? You get opposition. Uh, in, in the 19th of Acts, there's a, there's a like thing, where is it now? Um, okay, uh, let's say verse 24 of Acts 19. A certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom when he called together the workmen of like occupation said, Sirs, we know that by this craft we have our wealth. Wherefore, see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but also almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that there be no gods which are made with hands. So not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana, or what do you say, Diana? Diana? Should be despised, and a magnificent should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshippeth. Wherefore, when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath, and they cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians, and the whole city was filled with confusion. 
and caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, and rushed with one according to the theatre. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. Well, here again, you, you get the same thing. Uh, as soon as the heaven begins to move, all hell is stirred. Now, I understand by, I, I think, pretty good uh, authentic history, that what, like we sing choruses, we sing hymns before preaching, uh, the, outside that uh, a horrible building, at least that's used for a horrible purpose right now, where those captives are, in, in, um, in uh, Islam there, by, by Islam, in Iran, that they're chanting, this is a holy day, they're chanting not political slogans right now, but religious slogans, chanting, chanting, chanting. Well, that's exactly what they did. I understand that in a, before a great celebration in the Temple of Diana, that the congregation was ordered to chant certain praises to Diana, and they would chant them hundreds of times. They chanted for about 200 times. Why? Because you stir people's emotions up. Before Hitler made a speech in the, grand, in the, in the great sports palais in Berlin there, uh, there were 120,000 men. They had steel helmets on, they had their military gear, they were at attention, and they stood in the burning sun for two hours before Hitler spoke. With what? With the best military bands in the country. And they would stand there and, and the bands would strike up and then they would sing some great national anthems and they would all get stirred up emotionally. And then Hitler would come in because already they were emotionally stirred up. And it's very easy to impress people when they're emotionally stirred. A friend of mine used to quote the fact that, I don't know if it was Hitler say, uh, uh, Goebbels said to Goring, or Goring said to um, Goring and uh, Goebbels, get mixed up in the two, but one of them said to the other, when, it, when Hitler had been talking for about 50 minutes, oh, he's getting nowhere, he's getting nowhere. Now they couldn't say pray for him, he says wait. And then suddenly that burst of oratory came, and oh my, was he eloquent. Did he stir them? And Goebbels said to Goring, or Goring said to Goebbels, He's all right now, the Holy Ghost is on him. Now that tells me one of two things. It tells me that somewhere they'd been in meetings where they knew something about the Holy Ghost. And the other thing that they knew if the Holy Ghost came upon someone, that they were very different from when the Holy Spirit was not upon them. But you see, there's also what the Greeks call the afflatus. There's a place to which the orator gets, and I always call it like going down the runway and suddenly you take off. You don't know when it is. Sometimes in a meeting you get off in the first five minutes. Me, sometimes it takes me 25 to get off. But the fact is there is a point where you realize that another power has overtaken. I don't read sports pages usually, but I saw a picture of this, uh, one of the football fellows there in Dallas. And they were interviewing him and asking him some questions, and I always like to read interviews. And he said, well, when I'm talking to you, I'm one person. He said, when I'm playing, but he said, once I get the ball, I feel I'm possessed by something else. You see? It's, a, it, it's an inner consciousness. It, it's a sudden inspiration, if you like, which can work humanly as well as by a divine power. Well, Paul had the same experience, or if you want to reverse it, uh, Spurgeon had the same experience as the Apostle Paul. Immediately he began to move in the power of God. He got opposition. He got opposition from the world and the flesh and the devil. He got enemies uh, of the cross. They were against him. The people were against him. The devil was against him. Maybe often his own fears and weakness were against him. It doesn't alter the fact that he went on <coughs> to preach to about 8,000 people continually. You think, could God trust you and me with a congregation like that? He never got swell-headed. To preach to 8,000 people twice every Sunday for about 20 years, that's an awful, awful lot of people to, to minister to. Well, you say, then he was an eloquent man. Yes, he was an eloquent man. Uh, he was a good student. Yes, he was a good student. He had great authority. Yes, he had great authority. But then, why was he eloquent? Why was he such a good student? Why did he have such great authority? When people asked him the question, they said, now you've got the greatest church in the world, the tabernacle. What's the secret? Oh, the secret goes back six years, he said. He said, we, we, we have had for six years, the dew has never ceased to fall. And then he changed the figure. He said, the rain of blessing has never ceased to fall for six years on the tabernacle. 
uh, on, on the previous meeting house, Park Street Chapel. And he said the reason behind that was we had the greatest bunch of praying people that you could ever find in England. Now it used to be that when people went to tour that place it became a kind of, uh, you know, tourist. Anybody going to London, the spiritual, didn't want to go to Westminster Abbey necessarily, they, they wanted to see the uh, Spurgeon's Tabernacle. And they would always be taken to a back room and say, as soon as a preacher stands upon his feet, you've got a bunch of maybe 50 people in the back room holding up his arms like they held up the arms of Aaron and her. You see, you find people saying over and over again, well, you know, Charles Finney had a razor like mine. He was, I read somewhere, he was seven feet two. I don't know whether he was. If he was today, they'd have drafted him to a, to a, a basketball team. But anyhow, uh, I don't know whether he was seven feet two, but I know intellectually and spiritually and morally he was. But you see, uh, everybody says, look what a great man Finney was. But he had Father Nash and Father Cleary that used to go in the basement and pray for him. Each of them prayed 12 hours a day. Well, I think if I had two men like that, I'd be prepared to have a campaign in hell almost. Twelve hours a day, those two men, they never surfaced. I think the greatest people in the world today are unknown. I, I think that fellow that's not too far from here, and I won't tell you the town unless you go looking him up, and he wouldn't like that. This, this young man of 32 was, was mature that he can pray ten hours a day. To me, he's one of the great men of our generation. Other people will, will, will deliver the baby. He conceives the thing. He brings it to birth. Somebody else gets the glory. But one day the sword and the reaper rejoins together. In the Old Testament it said that those that stay at home will have the same reward as those that go to battle. Everybody wants exposure. Everybody wants a place in the sun, as they used to say. Everybody wants their share of credit. No. What was the name of that fellow that held the rope that let Paul down the wall in a basket? I can't remember the name. What was the name? Oh, don't scratch your head. Nobody knows. It isn't in the scripture. But I'll tell you what, he did a great job that day. If he hadn't held on the rope and somebody else let him fall down, what would have happened? There might have been no Paul to go on. There are so many people covered up their ministries. There's a scripture there in the book of the Revelation, Antipas. Antipas, A-N-T-I-P-A-S. And all it says is, Antipas, my faithful martyr. Where was he martyred? Why was he martyred? Well, what period of church history? What country was it? I don't know, and I don't care. But I know this, that you see, there are different crowns in eternity, and one is a martyr's crown, and everybody will have that. Antipas will have it. There's no record in here to inspire my faith. No, 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 no. But God just says, Antipas, my faithful martyr. You, you get a list of people who did amazing things by faith in Hebrews 11. It doesn't mention Joshua. I think he had faith. Boy, I'd need faith to go walking around the city without a sword or an uh, atom bomb in my pocket and, and just say, you know, at the end of the week, the last time you go around, ooh, 13 times, that's unlucky, we can't do that. But they went down and they pressed over the, the walls fell down. But he doesn't get any credit for it. It just says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. Oh, put him on the honors list. Huh? John doesn't recall that he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Other people was one of the greatest events in the life of Jesus. I want my name in that. No, he doesn't say he was there. You know, I, I, you may disagree, and if you, where you disagree with me, you'll know you're wrong, but... <clears throat> uh, uh, you, you, you may not think this right, but you know, I, I kind of figure you can't have your reward here and hereafter. God, we, we say sometimes, Jesus paid for our sins, and God doesn't ask me to pay, you can't pay a bill twice. Well, if you can't pay a bill twice, can you be rewarded twice for the same thing? You see, the Pharisees, loved the, 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 they stood at the street corners doing what? Stroking their beards. Why? Because they loved the praise of men. And Jesus says, and verily they have their reward. Their reward was to hear people say, go past and say, you know that man was there at 8 o'clock this morning, and you know he was there when I was a little boy 12 years of age, and that's 15 years back, and, and he's always there, and he always has his hands tight and his eyes closed, and he's always muttering prayer. He's one of the most praying men in the world. And the Pharisee, boy, he ate that up. 
Mmm, you talk about peanut jelly to, to a little boy and jam, boy, that's nothing like what he got. He got a kick out of that. I'm the holiest man in town. I'd love to hear them say that. And here's somebody else. And Jesus said that's his reward. They have their reward. And you go to a meeting, somebody says, who'll give a million dollars? They had a meeting in Dallas not long ago, and, and they started off, who'll give a million dollars? One guy flashed ten. He gave ten. And then others gave one, one, one. They didn't even ask poor people who only had half a million. You know, or folk on welfare who only had a quarter of a million. No, no. Once it got to a million and it stopped, they shut the meeting up like that. Yeah, I give one. Oh, there's Brother John over there. Oh, there's Brother Jack over there. Oh, there's Brother Don there. What does the scripture say? He says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. He says, don't display your charity before men. Well, those are scriptures we forget. But I don't believe, I, I believe a man gets his fill and he gets satisfied in seeing his name at the top of the list. Oh, you know, everybody else, they only gave a quarter of a million. And, and one or two gave half, he gave a million. He gave the biggest number. And there his name's flushed. I think that's his reward. I don't believe he got a reward in eternity for it. He got what he wanted. He got the praise of men. He got to be highly esteemed in the eyes of men. It shouldn't worry us whether we're esteemed or not. If the Spirit is bearing witness with my Spirit, I'm doing God's will. Well, forget it. If you live on the esteem of that, well, I've got one friend and he esteems me very highly. Hey, it'll be hard on you if he gets hit with a truck this afternoon, won't it? He'll have nobody to esteem you. You'll be flat on your face. He'll be flat on his back, but uh, you'll be flat on your face. What will you do? Because you're living on the esteem of others? No, no, no. Spurgeon had his enemies. Spurgeon had people who were constantly out to uh, kind of assassinate him, if you like. You know the same thing happened in the Welsh Revival? That wonderful young man by the name of Evan Roberts, God trusted him at 22 years of age to lead a nation in revival. And you know, after a year they tried to assassinate him. A group of men uh, went from Wales into Leicestershire where he was staying with, at the home of Mrs. Jessie Penn Lewis and her husband. And they, 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 they planned his death. Somebody tipped off the police and they, they stopped. What for? Because they didn't like what he was preaching. Why didn't these people like the Apostle Paul? Because he's damaging their income. They, they make shrines. They make uh, images of, of, the, of the goddess. They're making wealth out of religion. This man says it's all false. It's no more value than the dirt you tread on in the street. And those are not pro. You see, we live in a strange world. <laughs> if you do wrong, they'll put you to jail. And you know what? If you do good, they'll put you to jail too. Paul never went to jail for pinching and stealing somebody's purse, you know. Or robbing widows of other tithes. That was left to the TV boys. But, uh, no sir, he didn't do anything wrong, but he went to jail. The Puritans went to jail. John Bunyan went to jail. He spent, what, 15 years in jail and... Uh, what happened? Well, he wrote the greatest book outside of the Bible, the most circulated book. If you haven't read it, you should read it, Pilgrim's Progress, which has been circulated more than any book in history except, again, the Bible itself. It was a product of a period of darkness we talked of this morning, a period of opposition. Now, Spurgeon gives credit all the time to the, to the um, fact that behind him there was a, there was a whole... Uh, uh, fellowship of prayer which continually made intercession on his behalf it was said that no man if you could open a man's heart the Queen of England used to say that uh, Queen Victoria used to say if her heart was open you'd find Calais written on it that's Calais maybe you call it that's a, a, a lovely town opposite uh, Dover it's on the French coast and she liked to go there for a rest she liked to go there and relax and she said you'd find Calais uh, I think imprinted on my heart but they said of Spurgeon his love after Jesus Christ his great love was for for the city of London itself he loved it he prayed over it he wept over it he travelled for it well, well there's a cost again not only a cost in discipleship as, as Bonhoeffer says but the, the cost of gain of this is that, that Spurgeon would not be sidetracked into anything else it's an amazing thing when you think of a, a, a young boy that has no training in the Bible, he has no training in seminary. He's drawing the greatest crowds in the world, and then he opens a pa what he called a pastor's college where hundreds of men were trained for the ministry. 
Now people say the success of, of this amazing preacher was this because he held to Calvin's doctrine. Well, I won't give Calvin that credit. But I say it's because he held to the word of God. He stressed so strongly the blood of Jesus Christ, the atonement, which is not stressed too much in our day. We, we sing a hymn or two about it, but it is not stressed as it should be stressed. Not only the atonement, because that's half of the coin. The other half of the coin is what? Well, the resurrection of Jesus. And then he fought desperately for, again, for the inerrancy of the word of God. Now, now that really is a pattern. Because, you see, at the same time that Wesley was, upon me, the same time that uh, Spurgeon was being stirred, that 1859 revival was not only uh, wonderful here in America, it actually... As I said, it, it, it came after a period of tremendous prosperity. It came a time after, well, atheism was rampant, spiritism had been revived, uh, there, there was a new wave of free love, there was everything diabolical, and then God suddenly began to do it. But do you remember how he did it? I didn't tell you yesterday. There was a collapse in the monetary system too. Some of the banks couldn't pay up. At least one railway, one railway system closed down. Then there came the outburst of blessing in 1850, uh, what, 57, 58, round there anyhow. Now the same thing is, this revival broke out in London about 1859. But I have a book in my uh, office there, it's called This Year of Grace, written by Gibson. If you ever see it, buy it. It's the record of the year of grace, 1859. When the Spirit of God came on men in Northern Ireland, there is a record of revival in Scotland. When? In 1859. Now, in all these cases, without giving you laboring uh, the, the point of dates and personality names, but in every case I find a background of intense praying, a, a background of intense uh, agonizing. A time when men committed themselves to intercession, not just saying prayers. Now I say soul winning. Again, soul winning should not be a profession. It must be a what? A passion. Now let's get this straight too. That when you talk of intercessory prayer and travel, let me put it in a nutshell for you. It, it, travel, traveling prayer cannot be taught. It can only be caught. And it can, can be caught two ways. It can be caught by the Spirit doing something directly in your own heart or giving you to get in a fellowship where people really know how to pray, where they really know how to intercede, where they don't pray with one eye on the clock. That, that's fatal to prayer. The clock has to be forgotten. Friends have to be forgotten. Food has to be forgotten. Now when revival comes again, as I said the other day in giving you that outline, that you, you, you can't computerize it, you can't rationalize it, and all sorts of on. I said you can't rationalize it, you can't computerize it, you can't organize it, you can't subsidize it, you can't denominationalize it, you can't nationalize it. The only thing we can do is prepare the way of the Lord. And I reminded you again, I think that's one of the most awesome tasks ever given to a single man, Michael. He didn't have twelve disciples like Jesus. God says to John the Baptist, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. And you discover that be behind every revival, God has burdened some people to prepare the way of the Lord. But when that revival comes, it's not going to be a blueprint of the last revival. I read a little while ago something that was, I, 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 was tremendously inspiring to me and, and disturbing. <clears throat> Because I, I thought at times I'd been in revival. Well, I, I, in, a, in a measure I have, but not to this degree. One of the great revivalists of America was uh, uh, Dr. Jonathan Goldforth. Now, he went over to China and had awesome meetings. But his wife said, look, I want to tell you about the revival. She said, the, the, there was nothing you could predict. You can't say, you know, tomorrow's going to be a wonderful day. We've had a marvelous day today. For instance, he said, the spirit would descend and they'd be caught up and you wouldn't hardly know if you were in the body, you couldn't feel anybody at the side of you. You were so caught up in the spirit for eight and nine hours in pure 
adoration. Non-stop. Not stopping for a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, or running here. Just eight or nine hours, just caught in endless waves of ecstasy and majesty that you didn't think were possible this side of eternity. Uh, the next day, that, that, of course the meeting was going on 24 hours a day, but the next day the phenomena would not be that you were caught up and left speechless and almost exhausted with, with the marvelous uh, majesty of God. Uh, to inter interfere uh, here, uh, I'm not sure if Mel Tarry didn't say that in the revivals in Indonesia, there were times when a stillness would come and the angels would sing. But I met a man by the name, I, I didn't meet him, but I listened to him when I was a little boy. He wrote a history, if ever you see it, buy it, it's worth, uh, it's worth a lot. I've just got a copy, I'm not selling it. And a friend of mine has put it in a hard binding. I saw the Welsh Revival by David Matthews. David Matthews used to come and preach at the church when I was a boy. And David was saying one day, I remember distinctly, he startled me. He said in the Welsh Revival, a preacher was preaching and suddenly he said, Ha! And he put his finger up like that. And they heard the angels singing. The most amazing music you could ever hear. Now you can't order that. You see. If Billy Graham could order it, boy, he'd have that angel cry every day. All the Roberts would buy the whole thing out. But uh, you just can't do it. God manifests himself as he will. So one day we're caught up into awesome spellbinding praise and adoration. The feature the next day was stillness. You sit there, nobody drop off to sleep. Nobody would say what's happening around here. There will be a, a series, maybe a time of praise, not as intense as yesterday, or a time of prayer, and then suddenly God cut everything off. Be still and know that I'm God. And she said the most awesome thing to me was not the praise. Now she said there were other days when you get seven and eight hours of agonizing prayer, you think, you think people were being torn apart. They were groaning. They were wrestling against principalities and powers. They were seeing, as, as, as Whitfield said, I see people every day slipping over the edge of the abyss into eternity. I remember when I was a boy, we had in our church, we, in our church room where we prayed, we, we had different pictures. And one was somebody had taken the Niagara Falls, and instead of water going over, it was, it, you could, it was little people all falling into the abyss of hell. I never forgotten it. Now, George Whitfield said when he preached, he could see people at the end of the room falling into hell. That's what fired him. Or he said that when he was uh, giving a message, they said, for instance, if he was going to preach on, uh, if he was going to preach on hell, You'd think when he came on the platform, he'd been there for a, for a day. You could almost smell the brimstone. He was so devastating. He was so full of anguish to rescue people. But if he preached on heaven, you'd think he'd been in heaven for a month. He brought the glory and majesty of God with him. Now, usually our preachers have to come and tell one or two funny little stories. And, you know, it's kind of conditioning the audience. and uh, Everybody thinks, what a nice guy. No, 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 no. That's pure nonsense. But saying again, you see, that one day you've got eight hours of majestic praise when you, and maybe you could only stand that once in your lifetime, I don't know. The next time, the awesome thing is, uh, hours of intense agony until you sweat and you can hear people grieving. It's almost like hearing bones being broken. It's almost, as the Word of God says, like a woman bringing to birth. The next day is stillness. And she said, between the awesome praying and the majestic praise, between prayer and praise, the thing that was most inspiring to me was the total stillness of God. As I said yesterday, there's a stillness that kills, and there's a stillness that creates. You go to a prayer meeting, and everybody rattles off in prayer, and suddenly there's a stop, and somebody thinks, oh, I ought to pray because it's quiet, maybe it's my turn. No, no, no. Now, if that stillness is a stillness of death, you better pray. But if it's a creative stillness, we better listen to what God is going to say. So every revival has its different aspects, but every revival that I can read of has had behind it a, a group of praying people. The revival in Scotland had had, uh, had, had praying men and praying women. There had been revival in St. Peter's. I stood outside of St. Peter's in Dundee, in Scotland there. 
there's a, there's a rock as wide as this table and as high, a great big sheet of rock, and it says in this church, I think it's called St. Peter, this is the church where Robert Murray McShane had revival. He died at 29 years of age. He was a brilliant Hebrew scholar. Now, you remember the prayer of John Knox, give me children or I die? You remember the prayer of, um, who was it, Rachel in the, in the uh, 30th chapter, I think, of Genesis there, where, where she flings herself down in, in, in front of her husband? Uh, and she says, Jacob, give me children or I die. Chapter 30, verse 1. Rachel envied her sister, Jacob, give me children or else I die. John Knox translated that to give me Scotland or else I die. This blessed young man, this brilliant young scholar said, give me this city or I die. As I said to a very famous preacher not long ago, I'm glad you have a TV uh, that covers the nation. I'm glad you have a missionary problem. But outside you've got one of the greatest rivers of prostitution in this country. And behind you've got a monstrous old mansion filled with homosexuals from top to bottom. The scripture says begin at Jerusalem. It's all right saying we have a TV program. Do you know how many letters we got from California? Do you know how many letters we got from uh, Georgia? Do you know how many letters we got from Denver? Who doesn't get letters if you have a TV program? But, but who's touching all the lost people on your doorstep? Well, this man says, this city, I'm going to take this city for God. Now, after, when he had, when he had um, uh, died, it became a place of curiosity. People went along and they wanted to see the church and they wanted to walk in his office. And, and the old janitor there would say, uh, when preachers came and say, could I see his office? Yes. Uh, there's his desk. Sit behind the desk. Put your elbows on the desk. Put your head in your hands. Now weep. That's what he used to do. They go up the spiral staircase with its big lovely cushions and see this great auditorium. Church, as they say in England. Kirk, as they say in Scotland. Put your elbows on the cushion. Put your head in your hands and weep. That's what he used to do. You see, as, as we... As we uh, in the next session, in a few minutes, I think I'm going to talk about this, uh, about intercession. Again, intercession cannot be taught. Travel cannot be taught. It is caught. You can ask for it, you may not necessarily get it until you've been through a school of proving. You see, again, you, you go to... Uh, pe people talk about why did China collapse. You know, there was a period when no missionaries did any teaching in China. All they did was evangelize and then they decided to teach in schools and do other things and immediately they did. The spirituality theory deteriorated because God sent them there ostensibly to spread the gospel. Oh, well, this is one way to get favor. Oh, no, you don't need anybody's favor if you've God's favor. All hell can oppose you and all the government can oppose you. But if you've got God's favor, you'll get through. You see, anything... One of, the, one of the times I didn't talk, I talked a number of times with Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones in London, England, and he said to me one day, Brother Rainey, I don't have any problems spending hours... Ex you know, he, he's done marvelous expositions of Romans and Ephesians. And he said, I, I love it. He said, the hardest thing in my life is prayer. Now he's the most brilliant preacher in England, drawing the biggest crowd, and then he says, well, it's the hardest thing in anybody's life. Again, let me put it in your mind in case you don't have it there. In your life and mine as a Christian, the good is the enemy of the best. Satan isn't going to try and get you drunk tonight or be, become an adulterer or a liar or something. He's going to get you to spend an hour with those girls or those boys, and there are times when you need that, but there are times you don't need it. You see, the good becomes the enemy of the best. A fellowship with each other is, a, is no substitute for fellowship with the Father. Fellowship with each other is good. Fellowship with the Father and the Son is the best. Teaching kids in another country is all right. So I, I think maybe before long it's the only way we'll get in other countries anyhow. We so messed up the gospel. For instance, who's going to be admired when they come to America? Didn't Mel Tarry say as soon as he came in, in the airport, he went to the, uh, he went to the newspaper stand and... Oh! America! America! Billy Graham, Oral Roberts, Great Bible Studies, pornographic literature, all... In my country, heathen country, we don't have nude girls, we don't have all this filth. Go on the beaches, nudity see gay people marching through the city all the profanity or who wants our religion anyhow 
Why does it show up? I can remember when Billy Graham used to say he was glad he belonged to a Christian country. Now he's come to the conclusion, he said not long ago, there's no such thing as a Christian country. He should have known that at the beginning. There isn't. There are Christians in the country. There are some Christian countries better than others. But man alive, a Christian country wouldn't have a jail in it, would it? Except for you folk that do over 55 an hour. But apart from that, uh, <coughs> there'll be no uh, people in jail for crime because Christians do not commit crime. Christians didn't used to get divorced. I can remember in England when in the newspaper it said that the Lord and Lady or Duke and Duchess of so-and-so are being divorced. And immediately you said, oh boy, filthy people. If you're a divorcee, you are not allowed in Buckingham Palace. You are not allowed in the royal enclosure at, uh, uh, say, at Royal Ascot when the Queen went to see her horses running. You're a leper if you're a divorcee. That, that doesn't, that doesn't obtain anywhere. Doesn't obtain in the church anymore. You find people now in high places in the church, charismatics, Pentecostals, everybody's having problems. I wrote a man recently, he's one of the most staunch interpreters of Wesley's second blessing holiness. I said, hey, everybody that I find now, the churches I go in, they're plagued with divorce. You have any problem in the holiness folk? And he said, yes, it's becoming a problem with holiness people. Brother, how the barriers have gone down. Everywhere. And yet God wants to lift up a standard against this. Well, that ought to be something that burdens our hearts anyhow. But you see, this man sees, he sees the sin of the city and he says, well, and he had been a missionary, he had learned Hebrew and he had gone over to uh, Israel, Palestine as it was then, and God said, return to your own city. So he went back to Dundee. And he sowed, and he sowed, and he wept, and he wept. And he didn't see a breakthrough. But while he was away, a man called W.C. Burns went. Burns one day went to do some shopping down in Glasgow. There weren't many automobiles, in fact there were none in those days. There were a few horse and cart buggies going around and horses with, you know, big old flat carts taking freight around. And he stood at the side of the wall and his head was down and he was sobbing, sobbing, sobbing on the street. And a woman went past and she came back and, and said, William, and he looked and it was his mother. His mother said, and a woman went past and she came back and, and said, William, and he looked and it was his mother. His mother said, William, why are you weeping down here? Oh, mother, he said, listen, listen, listen to the thud of Christless feet. They're going to a lost eternity. Now, here is a man warning himself in, just like David Brainerd did. Uh, I mean, W... Uh, um, Robert Murray McShane, he had tuberculosis too. But he spent hours and days in intercession. He broke his heart. He travelled for revival. And while he was away, really partly on a health cruise as well, they told him this would restore his health, and partly to be a missionary, do a missionary job with the Jews there in Israel. While he was there, revival broke out. Well, isn't that too bad? The man that did all the sweating and all the praying and all the travailing? No, when he came home, he rejoiced. Oh, how he rejoiced. You see, that's why God could trust him with, with an experience where he's going to take all the burden and all the trouble and somebody else comes and reaps the harvest. But the good book says the sower and the reaper will one day, what? Rejoice together. You know, I would rather be the least in the kingdom of God than be the greatest in the devil's kingdom, wouldn't you? I'd rather be an unknown because one day we're going to be pretty well known, you know. It's not going to take long before the 17th and 18th of Revelation becomes true that Exxon and all these other boys are going to be howling and screaming one day and you know there's no division between the chapters in the, in the, in the Revelation and the next chapter says the saints are shouting hallelujah they're groaning and traveling. They've lost their millions. They've no hope. All their crime has come up to them. All the uh, times they've, you know, done all the d dirty work they do in high places. Intrigue and managing markets and all the other things. These cartels and these monopolies and all the other things that have robbed and destroyed. And they've lived like the kings of the earth and it's going to go wow like pricking a balloon one day. And you know, when they lose everything, you and I gain everything. When their kingdom perishes, our kingdom just comes in. When they've lost everything, we gain everything. 
and there's that good old song says I don't think there are many great modern songs but one I like is it will be worth it all when we see Jesus these people we don't know these people who laid the foundations in prayer and then died often without seeing what they labored for one day God says that those that have labored in secret is going to reward them openly won't that be a day man you talk about going to a homecoming won't that be a homecoming with the apostles and the prophets and the saints of old you know with old Elijah and Isaiah and all these folk in there oh boy it's not going to be great to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and all that redeemed that's going to be a day we'll all be wishing then we'd suffered a bit more and prayed a bit more and been zealous a bit more and labored a bit more for while salvation's free there's going to be no free reward there's going to be no buxy crowd, uh, crowns you know God Gabriel isn't waiting till we get in the door to tap a five decker crown on your head full of diamonds oh no 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 we're saved by, by we're saved by grace we're not rewarded by grace we're rewarded for works you won't get any more up there than you send up there that's why it says lay up for yourselves what? in heaven I used to wonder you know how in the world will it be the last shall be first and the first shall be last but the more I get to know some of these big shots I find that you know somebody recently said that the average preacher in America does not spend ten minutes a day in prayer and you think of a little guy hidden away in Texas that will pray ten hours today now I can understand why the last should be first and the first should be last why one day the nobodies will be somebodies and the somebodies will be uh, not quite nobodies because there will be no nobodies in heaven so cheer up uh, we'll all have some status there for sure but oh my what, 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 what a different thing it's going to be do you, remember, do you remember a phrase I've never heard anybody preach on it I haven't preached on it myself where the psalmist says store my tears in my bottle hmm? every time somebody shed a tear in travel you know it was plucked off their cheek and Gabriel stored it in heaven and one day all those tears are going to be poured out and it will be like spilling all the jewels and all the treasures of earth so different they've crystallized into jewels it's going to be very different in that day so let's believe God let's maintain personal revival let's believe God get a bunch of folk together and really pray and believe God for local revival thank you we have a break I think